You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast. The most listened to daily Miami Dolphins podcast on the internet. Come on, Dolphins fans. Time to fins up. Hello, Miami Dolphins fans. How are you today? And thank you for listening to the DolphinsTalk.com podcast. This is our draft preview show number two, as we are going to break down the offensive line and the running back positions. Joining me, as always, our in-house draft guru, Dante Colinelli. Dante, how are you doing today? Doing good. Happy to talk about some big boys today. This is one of my favorite position groups to talk about, so it's yeah. exciting. And- And this is a great draft for offensive linemen. So for a team like Miami, who needs some youth and needs some some players on the offensive line, this is the year to get it uh, because there's a lot of guys on the offensive line who look like they're NFL ready and who could maybe contribute early year one, year two-ish. So we're going to talk about all that. But before we get to any of that, as always, a big shout out to everyone listening at finheaven.com. Everyone go to finheaven.com, the largest Miami Dolphins message board on the internet. Also, a shout-out to our friends at the I Am a Miami Dolphins Fan Facebook page, run by the great and talented Carlos Hernandez. If you're on Facebook, please be sure you are on the I Am a Miami Dolphins Fan Facebook page. And wherever you're listening to this podcast, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Audible, Podbean, Podchaser, hit that subscribe button right now. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, hit that like button as well. You don't want to miss an episode. We have shows well, pretty much every day of the week to get you ready for the NFL draft between now and the end of the month. And then after the draft, we'll have some post-draft shows to do more of a deep dive into the players that Miami took. So check that out. Also, the Jalen Waddle Youth Football Camp is the place to be this summer. Join the Miami Dolphins star on June 22nd in Fort Lauderdale for skill-building fun and memories that will last a lifetime. Visit JalenWaddleCamp.com and register while spots are still available. Each camper will receive a limited edition T-shirt, a souvenir autograph, and a team photo with Jalen. Check out JalenWaddleCamp.com to learn more. That's JalenWaddleCamp.com. See you on the field. This is open to boys and girls, grades 1 through 8. Okay, let's get into the offensive line. And we're going to split this up a little bit to make it easy. First, we'll talk about the offensive tackles. Then we're going to talk about the guards and center. Then we'll end with running backs to end the show. And... Here's what I think, Dante, when it comes to the Dolphins in the offensive line, you know, everyone remembers last year the famous clip of Chris Greer saying this, day two of the draft. Well, I think you guys are probably more worried than we are, <laughs> you know, in terms of, you know, um, at the position depth at, at those uh, spots you talked about. But And he's talking about the offensive line there. And last year, for what Miami put together, you know, Isaiah Wynn, who was a first-round bust with the Patriots for eight games. He was fantastic here for Miami. It was only eight games, though. Armstead, when he plays, he's great. You're only going to get about eight to ten games from him now. You have to assume um, Connor Williams is gone. Aaron Brewer is here. Robert Hunt, they haven't replaced him. You got your Robert Jones types, and you got your Lester Cottons of the world, and you got your Liam Meikenbergs. We kind of know who they are. And then Austin Jackson just got paid. But I think, and tell me if you agree or not, if Miami drafts an offensive lineman in round one, it will be an offensive tackle as they have to now really think about life after Armstead, number one. Number two, this is a deep offensive tackle draft. Number three, Chris Greer in rounds one and two loves premium position players. We know their premium positions are quarterback, cornerback, wide receiver, edge rusher, offensive tackle. If you look at his history, Austin Jackson, Tua, Noah, three premium position guys. Robert Hunt was drafted as a right tackle. It didn't work out, but that was the intent. That was a premium position. The next year, Waddle, Jalen Phillips, Liam Eikenberg, premium position guys, rounds one and two. Yes, Holland and Raekwon are the outliers, but when you got nine picks in two drafts in rounds one and two, you can slide off that plan 
a little bit. But I think when you only have one pick around one, one pick around two, premium positions are going to be in play here. So would you agree if they take an offensive lineman round one or two, probably offensive tackle over garden center? I'm not saying it's impossible they don't take a garden center. I'm just saying I would probably guess offensive tackle. Laramie Tunsil him for a year, one year at guard, then move him out to offensive tackle. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And the more I've uh, written up like individual reports for players, I think the Dolphins could take. And and the last thing I do in all those reports is kind of explain my reasoning, right? Why I think Miami could be interested. What I've noticed is that it's very easy to just be like, hey, Teron Armstead's old and injured a lot. This is a position that they should address. When you start to plug in some of the interior guys that we'll get to on this show, you kind of are like, playing musical chairs a little bit more than maybe you want to. And what I think is really fascinating about this interior class is that a lot of the interior guys aren't guards, they're centers. So we'll, we'll get to that. But like, if I look at my interior rankings and if I remove guys who I have as like fringe tackles, I think the top three guys at that position group. So probably the guys that you would maybe consider in the first round, I think their best positions all center. Uh, And two of those guys only played center really at college. Um, The other one played center his freshman year and kicked out the left tackle. Um, So really, really interesting to think about that because the team gave Aaron Brewer, like not a big contract or anything, but like enough of a contract that makes you think that they want him on the field, right? Like this was not a, a Jack Driscoll signing. This was not bringing Robert Jones back. Like I'm not saying they paid Aaron Brewer too much money. I don't think that's the case, but yeah, they paid him enough money that makes me think he's going to be the starting center next year. And so if you look at this interior group and you say, okay, well, a lot of the guys you would take in round one are centers and we paid a center at least enough money to put him on the damn football field. He's too light to play guard. I don't want to see him at guard. So I I think that that pushes me towards tackle. Um, And I think what you said also makes a ton of sense, right? It's a premium position. And I just, I'm at the point now and Teron Armstead's a great dude. He's a really, really good football player. I, you just you can't count on him. You, you can't. And, and that sucks because it's not his fault. It's not like this dude is, you know, getting in trouble off the field or not working hard enough or that he's not a good football player. It's none of that. It's it's stuff outside of his control, but it is what it is. Like you, you just you can't rely on him for more than I don't know, eight games. You know, eight to like, ten. Yeah. It's max. Yeah. Like he he's never played a full season. Not a single time. I like I I it's tough. It sucks. And the flip part of this, and I, I try not to bring this up too often because I don't want people to crap on me for it. Um, Austin Jackson's had one good season. And you know what? Contract I, year. Contract year. Uh, too. One good season in a contract year. And I think there's a lot of caveats to why his season was good as well. Now, he got better. He got a contract. I'm fine with Austin Jackson at right tackle. My point is, is like, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty there where, like, I think you can talk yourself into that being a, a pick for the future and a pick for the present. Yeah, because I think a lot of these guys for one year, like we do with Laramie Tunsil. Laramie Tunsil, before that video leaked, was like going to go one, two, or three in that draft, probably one even. Um, that video changed a lot, and he fell. And Miami, I think that year had Brandon Albert. They really need left tackle. They play him left guard for a year, and then we all know what happened. Off Out with Albert, slide over Tunsil. It made sense. Um, and I can see with most of these guys that we're going to talk about, who would probably go, you know, at 21, some of these guys that we'll talk about who might go at 55, I think they have the ability for one year to play guard. I think moving from left tackle to left guard is not an issue. Even if they draft someone who's primarily a right tackle, like a J.C. Latham type or something, um, they need a right guard. So if you want to move him to right guard, then you then you just go with Isaiah Wynn at left guard. There's ways to make it work for a year, and then next year you can figure out oh, who's your – because maybe Austin Jackson moved back to left tackle. Who knows? You can figure that out, but you got to have two tackles on the team is the point that you can somewhat trust and you figure out who's going to play where. So let's talk about the top three who are going to go flying off the board and probably won't be there for Miami. Are these your top three? And, I, and some of these names I'm totally going to butcher, I admit. The first one I won't. Joe Alt from Notre Dame, probably first tackle off the board. Then the second one, the kid from Oregon State, Fuaga. And then the kid from Penn State, I'm not going to try his name. It's, it's like an eye chart, and it just is. So is it Alt? The Oregon State kid and the Penn State kid in that order for you. And you can um, live, you're going to say the names right. Yeah, so it is – those are my top three. I have the first um, – I have the guys flipped. I have Olu Fashanu, who's the tackle from Penn State. Look at you showing At off. number yeah. one. Um, 
And then I have Joe Ald at number two. Those are like, those guys are stacked, relatively speaking, right on top of each other. I got to be honest, I don't really care who you have at OT one or two, but I do think those two guys are better. Now I do have uh, Talisi Fuaga from Oregon State at number three. I'll speak on him first because uh, I get to victory lap him. Uh, I highlighted him in the summer as a very good football player. Um, and nobody was talking about him. And that's like maybe the only offensive line hit I had a year out of my entire career. So pat on the back for me. He's actually way better than I thought he would be. Uh, and, and that's what's kind of cool about this, right? Is he proved me right and also proved me wrong. I had him as like a second round player over the summer. And like you said, he's probably going to go. I don't think he's going to get past the Jets if we're being completely honest. I think um, his power, his size, I think he moves well for his size. This is... Um, He's not quite the freak that Makai Becton was out of Louisville, if you guys remember him. Oh, yeah. um, he's not quite that freaky. He's not that athletic. He's not that big, but he's like that style of player, right? He is massive man who moves better than you think with really good power. What I really like about Fuaga is his ability to um, block a, in a zone scheme, right? Oregon State does a lot of outside zone, inside zone. Um, and then they also have some gap power concepts. I think they do some duo uh, up there a little bit. Um, and we know that the Dolphins like to do a lot of that zone stuff, right? Like they like to run outside zone. They like to run outside the tackles. Fuwaga is built and has the mentality of like a throwback tackle guard guy who's just pushing the guy across from him. But he has the movement skills and the experience to be successful in his zone scheme. And I think that's what makes him a really appealing prospect in the top 10. I don't think he's going to get there to Miami. Fashanu is a weird one. So he's my OT1. Um, he was one of the first players I graded in this process. Um, I think he's really good. There are people out there who are concerned with his hand size, which is fair. He has like Kenny Pickett sized hands, which is not ideal. Um, it doesn't really show up on tape for me. I, I, it's not something I wrote down in my film notes. And, and I didn't even know he had small hands until he got measured at the combine or whatever it was at his pro day. Um, so that's an interesting concern. I think people are worried about his power because he lost some reps to power this year. I think he can add some core strength, but I don't know that you get players with this much experience and this many years of really good tape out of a power five conference with his athleticism. Like it's just, if you asked me to build the profile of an elite franchise left tackle, it would pretty much exactly be Olu Fashanu. Um, athleticism, length. Uh, he, I think people underestimate his power in the run game. I don't think he's a mauler. This isn't somebody who's going to run people over, but he'll open lanes, right? Like kind of almost Teron Armstead-esque, right? Like Armstead's not like this super powerful guy who's just mauling people all day, right? Like he, he, he works positions, leverage, you know, he does all those things. And Fashano to me is just a stalwart pass blocker, man. Like he can pass block on an island against anybody. And I think the Dolphins need that. Uh, and I feel pretty similar about Joe Alt. I think what separates Alt for me is I think um, he's a bigger guy. He's got more length and he's definitely more aggressive, right? He's more of in that, that Fuago <clears throat> mold where he wants to run people over in the running game. And I think there's some merit to that, but he gets a little bit off balance. Like he's a little bit unbalanced for me. He bends at the, the hips a bit much. Um, and I think he ends up on the ground a little bit more than I'd like. And again, like I'm nitpicking here, like Alt, Fashanu, Fuaga are clear first round grades on my board. They're probably, I think they top should 10. go. I think they should go in the top 10, right? It was what I was about to say. I don't think all three will go in the top 10. I think one of them falls just because receiver and quarterback are going to push guys down the board. I think one of them could get to like new Orleans at 14. Like that's where like the bottom of the barrel is for me. Um, but those three guys are very good. I'm, I'm really nitpicking them to death. Alt's great. He had a phenomenal season. He got a lot better from the summer as well. I wasn't as high on him coming into the year, but I think you saw better um, control in his technique. I think he had a little bit of a better anchor. He got stronger this year. There's a lot to like there. I think all three of those guys should be, you know, top 14 guys. And I think all of them can start at left tackle uh, right off the bat, which you all don't right. get to say a lot. No, you don't. You don't. So those guys probably won't be there at 21. This no. next group, the next group of players, there's a chance, you know, a few of them or all three of them might be there at 21. They are in no special order. You tell me your order. J.C. Latham from Alabama, Troy Fontenot from Washington, and Mims from Georgia. Are those your next three? And how do you have them ranked? And which ones? So now, Fontenot, most people see him as a guard as well, so I want you to talk about that. What are your thoughts on those three? 
Yeah, so that is like roughly the order. Um, I actually have Mim stacked uh, in the one poll there, but I'll, I'll save him for the end because I, I really like Marius Mims. I'll talk about Fontenelle. Um, so I have him rated as a guard, but if I switched him to tackle, he would be in between Mims and Latham. So like right in that number two spot. So um, I really like Fontenelle. I'll be honest, I had him as a guard and his combine performance and his measurements at the combine, like, I don't know. Like I kind of see tackle there. Like it's, it's, it's tough where, where I'm going to put him. I still think his best spot is guard. And the reason I think that is because he's really aggressive. He's a downhill run blocker. He wants to run people over. I think if you kick him inside, you are going to maximize that part of his game while not leaving him susceptible to being over aggressive against speed rushers on the outside. So like, that's why I see him at guard. However, at tackle, I'm just wildly impressed with his arms are not that short, right? Like I thought he had shorter arms and you know what? He, his arms are long enough, like long enough to play tackle. And that's nice. And he just looks so good in drills and he looks really good on tape, right? Like his footwork is good. His feet are, are fast. Like he loses some, some high side rushes and that happens. And I, I, that's another reason I like him a guard, but I think he could be a solid tackle for you. Um, he feels like a really good pick for Miami because it goes back to what you said earlier, right? Where like, you feel pretty good about him as a left guard in your one. And then if you move on from Teron Armstead, you're like, all right, we're going to kick him out to left tackle. And maybe he's not an elite left tackle, but he's a good starting left and plus tackle. Plus you have a year to evaluate. You have a year yes. every day in practice to evaluate to see if he is. And if he's not, that's cool. We solved one problem here at left guard, and now we still know next year, okay, we still have to address left tackle. So it does give you a chance to maybe find the guy, but at worst, like a Robert Hunt, take him for right tackle. didn't work out. He's a very good right guard. Same type of deal. Yeah, I completely agree. So, like, Fontenelle is, like, probably, like, the cleanest fit that we'll talk about tonight. Like, I think from scheme-wise, player demeanor, uh, where the Dolphins are picking, like, I would tell you – 21 like is perfect for him right like i don't know if i'd consider him in the top 15 i don't think he's quite that good but i think you get into that like 15 to 25 range like that's where i would start to think about him um so i i think he's going to run the scheme that you want to run he can zone block he can man block right we know how much the dolphins like to move their guys out in front when they call those gap concepts found those athletic enough to do it and he'll punish second level defenders with his physicality so he's probably like the cleanest fit that we're going to talk about uh tonight I think the question for Miami is, and we'll talk, uh, we can cross this bridge when we get to the interior guys, but do you value guard at 21? I don't know, right? Like they we kind of talked don't. about that, right? Like yeah. I don't know if I do either, as much as I don't I'm either. Like a, a big offensive line guy. Like I don't know. So if you, if the Dolphins look at Font now and they see him as just a guard, I don't know that they consider him at 21, but if they consider him a year one guard and a kick out to tackle, um, I think they could take him in 21. Um, I'll briefly cover JC Latham, who I have like a pretty high second round grade on. I don't hand out 32 first round grades. That's not how draft work goes. So I have a really high grade on Latham. He's like, uh, I'm kind of curious now. He's like top 20 for me or like right outside it. Uh, oh, is he he's a pure 30. right tackle though? Is he so a pure right tackle? In his career, yes. He is never, I don't think he's played left tackle. Uh, I think he only played right tackle at Alabama. I believe they planned to switch him to left tackle. I'm actually going to check it now because I don't want to misspeak. But um, so to my knowledge, he was a right tackle and they planned to switch him over and then they changed it. I think what you like about Latham is like tools, right? Like this is size, this is movement skills. Yeah, so he's only played right tackle. His only other experience, which is good to note for Miami, is 135 snaps at right guard in 2021. So if you draft him and you don't like him uh, replacing Austin Jackson, you can have him replace Robert Hunt in year one. Maybe he's at least got some juice there. I would tell you, though, I don't have a ton of interest in J.C. Latham playing guard. I just think he's too big, um, and I think that that's a thing that matters. He's six foot six, three 335. Like, I have a hard time imagining yeah. that he's going to be able to get good leverage from the guard spot. I don't think it would be like a total disaster, but like to me, this dude is built in a lab tackle. He's six foot six foot six, three thirty five. He's got the arm length. He's got the movement skills. He's got the experience. He's a two year starter at a huge program. He's only twenty one years old. I think when you get to Latham, it's the power is there. the The footwork is there. It's consistency for me. Like there are just reps where it's like, dude, like you know not to throw your hands here. You've played enough football. Like what are we doing? 
commits a lot of penalties. They're not like holding, they're more like false start. And I think the concern that I have with him is I don't know that he's confident in his own ability to handle speed rushes right now. I think he's trying to get out of his stance a little bit too quickly and he's false starting a lot against speed rushers. And I think if he just stands there, trust his, his length and his footwork and his athleticism, I think he'll be a lot better. So there's a little bit of development that needs to happen there. I think Latham at 21 makes sense. Um, but I don't know if I would kick him to guard. So like for me, Latham is a pick where I think you either have to see him as the next to Ron Armstead or you're moving Austin Jackson. And I don't know if Miami's going to get into that conversation. Uh, yeah, the last I guy, yeah, I yeah, wouldn't. the last guy in this group, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> this is probably my personal favorite pick for the dolphins at 21. I really like Amarius Nims, man. Um, I, he's, he's really good. I think so. The first thing that everyone brings up with Mims, the lack of experience, he hasn't played a lot of football. And I, I understand that he did not start at Georgia in 2022. He was behind Broderick Jones who went in the first round to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, you know, it's not like he was behind, you know, some bum here. Like this is a first round pick. Who's a good football player already. Um, but when he did get into the game, he got in during the college football playoff. You go watch the college football playoff from two years ago and Georgia won the national championship. Mims might be the best player on the football field. Like that, that tape is phenomenal. It's so good. Um, it, it, it has everything that you could possibly ask for from a franchise left tackle. This year was supposed to be his big breakout year. And he just no like serious injuries, right? It's not a guy with like torn ACLs or like a bad shoulder. It's just like, it's small stuff. I think he had tightrope surgery on his ankle, which is something that two has had. Like it, it got, you know, two, three weeks. Uh, he pulled his hamstring at the NFL combine, right? It's like small, like softer tissue stuff with men. So like injury concerns, yes, but I, I don't know that they are concerning to the fact that like they're detrimental to him, right? And I think if his medicals are clean, you feel pretty good about that. Um, and I think the other thing that people talk about with him, right, is a lack of experience and, Look, he has only played more than 300 snaps one time. And like, I, I get the concern there. But when I watch this guy on tape, I don't see a raw player. I really don't. Like, I see a pretty, like, technically sound player. I think he moves his feet well, uses his length well. Um, he takes good angles in the run game. I think he, he communicates well with his fellow Georgia offensive linemen and how they pass off stunts and handle pressures. And I just think you have a guy who, like, there is not a single physical tool that isn't at this man's disposal. Like he is a mammoth, mammoth player. Um, real quick, 6'7", 340. That's 91st and 94th percentile. 86-inch wingspan, 97th percentile. Arm length, 36 inches, 95 percentile. Hand size, 11 inches, 97th percentile. Oh, and he broad jumped uh, 111 inches, which is 85th percentile. Um, now he's a vertical jump, 19th percentile. He's 340 pounds. I don't really care how much he jumps straight up in the air. No, I don't care. Um, so he is huge and he is explosive. And when you watch him on tape, it's just this guy who is just more physically gifted than everyone else on the football field. And he's playing in the SEC at Georgia. And I just have a hard time imagining a universe where this guy is bad. Right. Like maybe he doesn't reach his ceiling. Maybe he doesn't become an all pro, but there's just like too much here for me to think that he's bad. And I think what's really nice about his fit in Miami is if you draft Mims at 21, it's perfectly fine to just be like, hey, he hasn't played a lot of football. We're going to sit him. Yeah. And, and, and like, fans I, won't like it, but you're right. No, but it, it, like that is a completely justifiable <laughs> outcome. And honestly, I wouldn't care. I'd be like, sure. You know, like Armstead will get hurt in 10 weeks and we'll see what we got for seven games. And then he'll be the left tackle for the next 10 years. Like, I would not care about that. And I think if you're the Dolphins, right, if you're Chris Greer and you're saying, hey, you know, we're not as worried about the offensive line as you are. Well, you can still say that and draft the Marius Williams in the first yep. round. And so for me, it's it's a scheme fit. It's a it's a, a, a player that I think has a lot of upside and a lot of athleticism. I think those are two things the Dolphins really value under Mike McDaniel. Um, I think he's he's a perfect fit, me personally. I don't think it's quite as seamless as Font now, just because I don't think if if the Dolphins draft Mims at twenty one, I have a hard time thinking he's going to be on the field in week one. And I know that that's going to 
upset some people. Like you said, there are going to be a lot of fans and a lot of analysts who are not on board with that. And I, and I think there's a fair argument there, but to me, like, I just think this guy's going to be a really, really good tackle. Uh, and he played right tackle at Georgia, but uh, I listened to an interview that he did during the combine where he said he actually practiced at left tackle at Georgia, even though he did not play left tackle in Georgia's games. So this is not a player that you have to completely teach a new position. He's already begun that process. So I think that's another plus. Well, here's something else with Mims too with Georgia, especially not so much this past year, but the year before, you know, he might have only, I think he started eight games total, something like that. Um, They're in a lot of blowouts where he's on the field a lot in the second half of games. Uh, George is up by a lot. I mean, this past year, not so much, but the year prior they were. So, you know, he didn't have so many starts, but he was on the field some. um, And, Again, SEC, athletic. We know Mike McDaniel. He doesn't like his offensive lineman to wear knee braces because he thinks it slows him down. He wants athletic, fast guys out of the boom, right out of their stance. Someone like Mims has the size, has the athleticism. Um, I think he's in play at 21. I don't I mean, I don't know. Again, if they want someone to come in year one and play, he might not be the guy. But if they have patience, like this past offseason, they've showed a lot of patience. Yes, they lost Wilkins. Yes. Yes, they've lost Raekwon. Yes, they lost Hunt. They didn't go out there crazy spending money to replace any of these guys. They're showing patience. So if they have patience, then he might be a long-term answer. Plus, you get a fifth-year option if you take him around one. That's a factor. Okay. After that group, two guys who I see in a lot of mocks and people talking about them around one guy. Tyler Guyton, Jordan Morgan. Where you got them? What are your thoughts on them? Is 21 too high for either of them? Or are they in play? If Miami trades down for 21, say they go down to 29, 30, pick up some extra picks. Are they a fit there maybe? Yeah, I like that a lot better. I would consider them more back end of the round one guys. So I have Guyton ranked just below JC Latham. uh, And then I have Jordan Morgan ranked just below Tyler Guyton. So those would be my next two guys. Um, Guyton's a weird one. He's in that men's mold. This is a guy who's bigger than everyone else. He's more athletic than everyone else. I would tell you in a, in a bubble, right? Like if I have to go win an Olympic competition tomorrow and I have to bring one of these tackles, I'm bringing Tyler Guyton. Like, I just think like generally, maybe not like NFL functional athleticism, but like raw athleticism. I think Tyler Guyton's the most uh, uh, athletic offensive tackle in this class. I mean, he is like, dude is fast. Like he runs on tape and you're like, and he's got a tight end background, right? So he's actually converted tight end. And that's where some of the inexperience comes in. He just hasn't played a lot of offensive tackle. Um, and it's a little bit different than Mims' inexperience, right? Because Mims has been a tackle. That's it, what the guy does. He's practiced a tackle. Guyton just took like, down the field. Yeah. yeah. Guyton's just truly like a, hey, I'm still learning the position type of guy. And so for me, Guyton's a huge project. Um, but I, I like the raw, the raw skill set there, right? Like there's a really good tackle in Guyton. I think there's a regular good tackle in Guyton too, but he needs some work. I think. Mims doesn't get on the field for the Dolphins in year one because they have the tackle spots like kind of figured out, at least for the short term. I don't think it's a, a, a comment on his play. For me, it's it's Guyton. I don't know if I want him on the field in year one because I don't know that he's ready. He needs to add some more weight to his frame. He needs to become stronger. Jordan Morgan is like pretty much everything I just said, but the opposite. Like he is your classic, like low floor really solid technician um, tackle, right? Like he can come in, you know, I don't know that he's going to be a world beater for you, but I think he's going to be a really solid football player. He's going to be steady. He's going to show up. He's going to play well. He's got a lot of experience playing in his own scheme. I think you liked some of the battles that he had against some Pac-12 rushers, which we'll talk about when we do that show. Like I thought he did a really nice job on the Atu Latu and their reps against UCLA. That's a first round player. You like that. Morgan has played a lot of football. He's a, I think a three-year starter now at Arizona. He might be a four-year starter even. Um, he's, he returned really, really quickly from a torn ACL. He was probably going to come out last year and decide to go back to school after he tore his ACL. Um, so I really like Morgan. I think you could kick him to left guard too. So that's a, a plus for Miami. I think that he could play at left guard. And I think honestly guard might, could be his best position, but I want to see him attack. I think he's got the foot speed. I think he's got the technique for it. Um, so I would try him a tackle first, but if you're Miami again, they're kind of, they have to reverse that path because they already have Toronto Armstead. So I like those players, like you said, maybe with a trade back. Yeah. And w- when we get to round two, 55, I'm going to throw out a few names, talk about any that you want to talk about. If you got some others, throw them in there. 
the kid from BYU, Kingsley, and I'm not going to try the last name, uh, Patrick Paul from Houston, who I know you're not a fan of, Christian <laughs> Jones from Texas, and Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. 55, do any of them make sense? If Miami goes edge rush around one or tackle and round, or, you know, someone on the front seven on defense in round one, the round two, let's address the offensive line. Do any of those you think are a good fit at 55 or is there someone else as an offensive tackle who might be a fit there? Yeah, those those are like kind of the next group of guys that I have. Kingsley Sue Matea from BYU is another really nice developmental left tackle. I think he has all the traits that you could possibly want. There will be people who that have him in that Tyler Guyton tier or they have Tyler Guyton in the Kingsley tier, depending on how high they are on Tyler Guyton. Um, for me, I think Guyton's got more upside and I don't know that he's as raw as everyone thinks he is, but we'll see. I, with Sue Matea though, I think you get the athleticism that you want in a starting caliber left tackle. He has the size, he has the length. I just think the technique's not quite there yet. So I don't know that he's a guy that you want on the field in year one, but if you're taking him at 55, I'd like to think that you're willing to develop him. I don't know that he's a guard guy either, um, but scheme fit wise, I think he'd be great in his own scheme. I think that would be perfect for him. I think probably if I had to pick any team in the NFL, it's a perfect zone uh, fit for him is probably Miami or San Francisco, right? So you're just kind of yeah, makes sense. batting with those two. Like, I think that's where he belongs. I'm not a Patrick Paul guy, as you mentioned. Yeah, I know. Um, I he's a day three player for me. I don't I don't get it. I don't see it. Like this, you you said this. Sure, I had a round one, pick twenty one. I think to Miami. Yeah, dude. I oh man, I'd be sick to my stomach if, if they pick <laughs> Patrick Paul in the first round. I, I really would be. And this this is like I don't think Patrick Paul's like some terrible prospect or anything. But um, so I I graded fourteen offensive tackles. He's my offensive tackle fourteen. I, I like I, and I don't have like a horrible grade on him. It's a good tackle class. I, I think that pushes him down the board. But to me, he's really big, right? I want, I want to bring up his his uh, metrics here because he's a really big guy. But I think the problem with Paul for me is that – so he's 6'7", 315, which is huge. I don't think he moves good, right? So one of the things that we've talked about in, in these guys, right, is the J.C. Lathams of the world, the Kingsley Sue Mateas of the world, the Tyler Guytons, the Amarius Mimses, the Talisi Fuagas, these like – massive human beings to me what truly makes them special is that they can move they're they're quick they're explosive they don't look like completely just labored out in space they can get to the second level i don't see that with paul like i see a player with slow feet uh, a player who is going to struggle against speed rushers a player who leaves his chest open to power rushes a little bit too often so like i don't know that i see a developmental upside with paul and i think he's going to get that peg from a lot of people just because he's big and they're gonna be like oh well i can teach him and it's like okay but you need the natural skills to build upon and i'm just i'm not there with paul and this is a dude who's played a lot of snaps like this is not like an experience problem and that's the other thing that worries me this is a dude, he's a three-year starter he played more than 900 snaps in 2022 and 2021. He played 770 snaps this past season. Like, what what are we waiting for? Where's the development? Uh, like, serious question. And and I covered the American when I went to Temple for a few years. Like, this is a player that I have seen play over the years. And and again, like, I don't want to make it sound like I just like like Paul's not a terrible player. If the Dolphins draft him and you know they they get like a third or a fourth round pick and they take him, uh, it's fine. Sure. Great. He's yeah, huge. Great. He can be a swing tackle for you. Fine. But, but I, most people got to be going way higher than that, though. That's the thing. That's the prize. Like, I, I don't see that. Uh, the last name that you mentioned is someone I like a lot more. That's Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. I think he's got the athleticism. I think he has the size. I like him as a zone run blocker. Um, I'm surprised he's not getting a little bit more hype. I have like a very high like day two, uh, day three, like fringe grade. On him, like I, I technically have him on day three, but he's like so close to day two. Who cares? Um, he's right there. I really like him. I think you have to clean up his hands a little bit. He's a little bit not sure what he's doing as yeah. far as initial placements concerned, but um, I think he brings a lot to the table. Uh, he would be like, I don't know. He would be like my target if if they end up with like a third or a fourth round pick. Like I try to go after Fisher. I think Sue Matea goes top. 50. I don't know if he gets to 55. I just that, think that some of the guys yeah. fly off the board and he's got enough of the tools. Um, so Fisher would be my target. I don't get it with Patrick Paul. Yeah. Um, and it does come down to what Miami does here in roster construction. We know the needs. We spoke about him on last show. Edge rusher and just front seven on defense. Anything front seven, really. 
um, offensive line and wide receiver, the three biggest needs. They could use help in, um, at safety as well. I know this week I was listening to Pat Kerwin and Jim Miller on Sirius XM NFL Radio. They are convinced Miami should take a safety you know, early in this draft because they think safety is the biggest need. That's their opinion. But those guys are pretty dang smart, too, at the end of the day. Um, so we know the needs. And I think if Miami does, if they go offensive line around one, I don't know if they're going to want that guy to sit. And you can make the case. We're going to start Liam Meikenberg at right guard, Isaiah Wynn at left guard, and that's their offensive line. Well, pick 21 sitting on the bench wearing a baseball cap. That's going to be a tough sell, probably even the owner at that point, too. But that might not be the bad pick if it is someone like Mims. If they go someone like Fatno, most likely he's a plug-and-play day one guy at guard. And then they can see and wait what happens at tackle. If they wait to round two, some of the names we just mentioned make sense. Now, look, they plan on having three third-round picks in 2025. They can't trade um, the two comp picks because they're not official yet. But they could trade their own third-round pick next year if they want to move up in round two to maybe get the kid from BYU, knowing most likely, because we're not stupid, they're going to get two comp picks in round three next year. That's that's also a fact because if they got to go from 55 to 48, you know, that's not a crazy move to make. They can do something like that. But that's if they want to go offensive line, you know, round one or round two. If they don't, they want to wait. So, you know what? We're going to go edge rush around one, wide receiver around two. We're, you guys are way more worried about the offensive line than we are. <laughs> Who are some guys post round five and later, offensive tackle wise, that, you know, this guy's got some, ain't going to play early, but has some traits that are like, he might be something. Yeah, so there's a there's a few guys. Like I said, I only ranked uh, 14 tackles. 14, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll dig like on guys that I've done like preliminary work on. Uh, the most interesting one, I have no idea where this guy's going to come off the board. I have no clue. But Kieran uh, Amagaji, I believe, is how you pronounce it. From Yale, is a guy that some... I saw him mentioned last week, and I haven't done any research or read up on him. But yeah, his name's sneaking up somewhere yeah, yeah so that's thinking. why i said i just have like no idea where he's gonna go so um like i think um trevor sikama from pff has him as like a top 60 player in this class i don't know if he's gonna go that high um but his film is like really interesting he has the athleticism that you really like he has the length six foot five 318 um a guy at Yale, you want to see him dominate? I felt like he did. Uh, I don't know that this was like – we've seen some other like lower-level tackles have like better tape. Like if I remember uh, oh, the, the kid from North Dakota State, Dylan Raidunes, who ended up uh, – I think he plays guard for the Titans now, which he hasn't really worked out, so maybe that's a bad example. But I, I felt like he was physically dominant enough in the Ivy League to where I'm convinced that this is an NFL-caliber player. Um, so he's a guy that I would watch. I have no idea where he's going to go. He only played 234 snaps this year at Yale. Um, so this is like, this is major projection. Like it's all projection, yeah. but like the tape is, it's good. It's good. He's got some traits. I think he's worth talking about. Um, I think some of these guys that I have listed, will get to a guard. Maybe, uh, Roger Rosengarten's another one from Washington. I think he's got the size. He's six foot six, 300. I'm a little bit worried about like, I don't know that he's a player that I would think can develop into a starter. I think if you draft him in round five, if he's there, which I don't know, um, he's like a swing tackle for you, right? Like I think he occupies the Kendall Lamb roster spot. So I don't even know if they bother at that point. Like I, I think you probably just roll with Kendall Lamb, but I like Rosengarten a little bit. He's got some speed. He's got some length. Um, worry about the functional strength, though. I don't think he's very strong. Uh, let me think. Those would be like the big ones. Uh, Walter Roos from Oklahoma is kind of interesting. Has the size, six foot six, three twenty two. Um, pure left tackle. He's played a lot of snaps. Three year starter. Uh, I think if the Dolphins want somebody who is going to be a bit of a more of a mauler type, right? So a little bit outside of their usual prototype. I think that's where Roos gets a little bit interesting. I think he's a better man blocker than zone blocker. So they'd have to like step outside what they typically like at the position to draft him. But I don't know. You like the measurables. He's got some juice. He's played a lot of football. Yeah. I, I'll be honest. I'm not a huge fan of taking offensive linemen on day three. Like I, I, I unless seems it's like, like a just, guard or a center. Put him on the practice squad. And it seems like sometimes they maybe make the roster, but they don't see the field often. No. Especially at, Offensive tackle. Offensive tackle to me, outside of quarterback, 
is like the one position where if you get one, it's good. You can't lose them because it's so hard to get good offensive tackles. And it's yeah. also a position that's become so expensive that yeah. the fifth year option really is needed on offensive tackles just to have some price control with the salary cap these days. Um, that's why with offensive tackles, I agree. Offensive tackles value to me round one, if you can get a good one that you feel great about is where you go get them because that fifth year option is important. And plus that's a tough position. It's hard that they, how come we got so much for Laramie Tunsil? Because Houston couldn't find a tackle to save their life, and they tried. <laughs> it's it, it's tough to get good left tackles or yep. or even right tackles nowadays. But yeah, there's it. Now let's talk about center guard here. There's two guys who are projected to go in round one: um, Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, who Dolphins fans are a segment of Dolphins fans who like worship the ground this kid walks on. He can play guard, but he's mainly known as a center. But he's got snapping issues from some of the research I've done, so it's kind of really baffling. The other kid is Graham Barton, who's projected center guard, but has played left tackle, you know, most of his time in college. But I'm going to throw him here in the center guard talk because everyone you talk to says in the pros he'll probably be a guard or center. Who's ranked higher in your eyes? And does Jackson Powers Johnson's snapping snafus at times give you pause for concern? Um, so I have powers Johnson ahead of Graham Barton. I think I'm probably a little bit lower than consensus on Barton, uh, which we can talk about the snap concerns with powers Johnson. I don't want to say no, because there's some issue there. Yeah. But at the same time, like huge, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I really don't. It's not something that I like flagged as a big problem on tape. And like Bo Nix is a big quarterback. So like, I don't know, maybe a smaller quarterback like Tua, maybe you worry about that a little bit more. No, like, I I mean, if he's snapping it high, Bo Nix is like, I don't know, a couple, at least a couple inches taller than Tua. So, um, but I don't, that wasn't really something that I noted too badly on tape. He had a few that were like, all right, come on, man. Like, you know, we got to get the ball off the ground at least. But (laughs) I I also think like you can kind of clean that up. Um, and I, so I used to care a lot more about that. And then I listened to Jason Kelsey's podcast this year and he was just like, I am the worst snapper of all time. Do you know why Jalen Hurts is always crouching before the snap? Because I suck at snapping the ball. And you know what? That dude's a first ballot hall of famer and he couldn't snap for crap. So I, I've come around on that issue a little bit, a a, a tad. It's, it's a problem, but it's not one that's like going to keep me off it. Now. Here's a question. Yes. You said you don't see Aaron Brewer as a guard. He's too light. Yeah. Can Jackson Powers Johnson play guard then if you don't want to move Aaron Brewer? So I think if the Dolphins draft him, I think you have to do it that way. And that kind of brings up its own set of problems. Now, like Jackson Powers Johnson is like, I don't want to call him big, but he's heavy. He's 328 pounds, which is 98th percentile for a center. If you move that to just interior offensive line, it's still 89th percentile. So like he has the, the, the girth to play guard. Um, he's actually he kind of almost looks more like a guard on tape, right? He's a big center, man. Like he did a big dude in the middle. Um, the problem with him at guard is like he has small arms, right? So that would be 18th percentile arm length for, for guard, uh, which is not great, right? Like usually you kick guys into guard because they don't have long enough arms to play tackle. This guy's a below average arm length for guard. And so that's a little bit concerning for me. Um, but I, I think you can play him at guard and I think he'll be good. Like, I, I think he would be a good guard. I think the Dolphins can do that. He's got the right mentality for it. This dude wants to kill people. No, it's like that, that, that's what he, no, like he just, he fires off the ball and he's just beckoning dudes. He's running 15 yards down the field, planting Washington state safeties in the next week. Like he, he loves hitting people, and that's great. That's what I want at guard. I want dudes who like hitting people at guard. Um, so Powers Johnson plays like a guard. He's just not – he's got the weight. I just The arm length is a little bit concerning, especially when teams are playing different types of interior players, right? It used to be back in the day it was these big bowling ball dudes with short arms, and they just pushed really hard, and it was like, all right, like we can get away with a guy who has shorter arms on the interior – you know, now you got these like hybrid dudes who are six foot five, 285 pounds with vines for arms coming at you. Like it's a little bit different, right? So I don't know. There's some, there's some holes into projecting him to guard, but I think he'll be fine. I I don't, I don't think he's going to go in the first round anymore. Um, I think I've seen that recently. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Intel is slipping on him a bit. I've heard some people mention some injury concerns. I 
couldn't find any big ones. He hasn't been available for the draft process. Um, I don't think he participated in the senior bowl or he did. And then he had to leave early. Obviously um, he did not test at the combine either, or no, he did his broad jump. That's it. That's the only thing he did at the combine. So um, I don't know. I've heard some injury concerns pop up. I've heard teams aren't as high on him as the media is. I like him. I have him just outside of a first round grade. I think he's a really good player with good tape. I don't know that I would take him at 21 anymore just because I think just I wouldn't take Aaron any guard Brewer. at 21. Yeah, I wouldn't take no like guard or center at 21. It's just it's tough. It depends on the board. If like yeah, if all the tackles are gone and Brian Thomas is off the board and it's like and you're hell bent on any offensive lineman around one, yeah, then yes. Like if they take Jackson Power Johnson at 21, I'm not gonna be <laughs> upset. Like I, I honestly, yeah. I'll be so happy that Chris Greer finally took an offensive tackle in the first <laughs> round and Austin Jackson. But, you know, I'll be happy, right? But I, I don't like it's not it's not my favorite choice. I, there, there's a there's a list of options I, I'd have above him. Okay, Graham Barton. So Barton is uh, it's a lot of the same conversation, man. Like it's so I think Barton's best position in the league is center. Like I I, I think that's where he should play. He played center at Duke in his freshman year. He played in six games and had five starts at center as a freshman. Their first two centers went down. Like he stepped right in. And this was like not like a five-star recruit. This was a three-star recruit playing in the ACC. Dude played good as a freshman. I went back and watched his center tape. It's like good, especially for a freshman player, right? Coming right out of high school. Uh, So I was impressed with that. I think at tackle, I think he has the foot speed to play tackle, but short arms, I worry a little bit about his play strength. I don't think he's not weak and his anchor isn't terrible, but it, he's going to lose some reps to, to NFL guys who are bigger and stronger. Like it's just, it's going to happen. It's going to take him some time to build up some more core strength, add a, maybe a little bit more weight to his frame. I don't think he needs a ton, just a bit, right? He's just got to round out. There's a, there's a transition period for offensive linemen in the NFL. Barton's going to have to go through it. This is not a Marius Mims who's just built like a house and carries it better than anyone I've ever seen. Um, so I like Barton in his own scheme. I think that's a perfect fit for what Miami does. I think he's got the aggressive mentality to do the, the you know, the pull plays that they like to do, the gap scheme things that they like to do. So he's a good fit. It's another one where it's like, look, they take Grant Barton at 21. I get it. Like, it's sure. He's a good football player. He's going to come in. He can play guard for you in year one. If you don't like Aaron Brewer at center, he can kick in the center. You can throw somebody else at guard. I think in year one, he can maybe be like your backup left tackle in a pinch. Me personally, though, I don't think he's a tackle at the NFL level long term. If you have to play him there for a couple games, I think you'll be fine. I don't think he's going to tank your season or anything like that. But long term, I, I just think he's an interior player. He's just doesn't quite have the length for me to, to feel comfortable leaving him at tackle for, you know, a whole season. Kind of reminds me of Justin Pugh from Syracuse a few years back. He can play he, a few positions, not great at any of them really. Got probably overdrafted a little bit, but not going to hurt you, not going to kill you. Just he's a solid B plus player. Don't know if he'll ever be an A. So here's a here's a fun fact for you. Justin Pugh went to my high school. Really nice. Yes. Council Rock High he School. Follows me South. on Twitter now, and uh, I know he just started a podcast recently. Good guy. Yeah, I used to. Uh, my first job in high school was working at uh, like this local like farm store that we had. His parents yeah. used to come in all the time. They were decked awesome. out in their Giants gear. Yeah, so Pew, big fan of Justin Pew, man. Let's yeah, go. he kind of reminds me of uh, Barton here, just from like what we're all saying about. Okay, so again, I think you're kind of like me. Center guard round one, probably not ideal. More of like an offensive tackle if you go offensive line. Pick fifty five in round two if they want to take a guard center. That's awesome. I'm on board yep. with that. And some of the names, Christian Haynes from UConn, who Mel Kuyper had mocked to Miami today um, in round two. Zach Frazier, center, West Virginia. I've seen him mocked. Cooper Beebe, Kansas State. And Cedric Van Pran Granger. That's mm. that's that's a lot of letters on the jersey from yeah, Georgia. Is. Do any of those guys at 55? Haynes is, Haynes is interesting. UConn, great at basketball. Stinks at football, but <laughs> this kid's got the skill set. Obviously, where you, you got to overlook that sometimes. And Zach Frazier is he a guy who's purely purely a center in your eyes? Yeah, so Frazier is purely a center. If he was on the board at fifty five, I'd get a speeding ticket running the card to the podium. Um, I, I think 
skill like film wise, he should go way before that. I think some of the reasons he could fall to 55 or maybe he falls to a range where, like you talked about earlier, Miami could move up for him, kind of like how they did for Liam Eikenberg in the second mm-hmm. round, which that, you know, yeah, they moved up. Yeah, not hindsight, not, not wise. Yeah, but like, they had the right idea, right? Like that was the logic. Yeah, yeah, right. So I could see them doing that for somebody like Frazier. He's a pure center. I have no interest in seeing him a tackle. No guard. I mean, sure, maybe. Um, Frazier's really cool because I think he is like a zone blocking technician. Like I think that's his best trait. That's the best thing that he does. He is a zone blocker he knows where to put his hands he knows how to use angles he knows how to how to create and and maintain leverage he knows how to seal rush lanes like he is an experienced multi-year starter in a zone scheme that's what he does snap in snap out this is not a guy right like jackson powers johnson gets a lot of love because he's 328 pounds and he moves like he's shot out of a cannon right like frazier's not a bad athlete or anything but he's just fine you know he's not gonna explode he's not gonna you know run crazy down the field and make a crazy block on a second level player but he's just like really solid he doesn't make mistakes very often he knows where he's supposed to be and i think like at center a position that you have to communicate a position that you know other people in offensive line look to you to to make calls point out mics you know adjust uh, uh pass uh protection right like a lot of that falls to communication between the center and the quarterback and to me like that matters and i think frazier's really good at that now he could fall because he's been dealing with a broken leg he broke his leg in november and he got healthy enough to compete at the big 12s combine which was like the last week of march which like pretty good that's pretty pretty dang good pretty pretty good yeah yeah that's a that's pretty good. So I, I'm a big fan of Zach Frazier. I would get I would get a uh, an infraction for turning that card in so yeah. fast. Um, so the other guys, Christian Haynes, I like a lot too. He's a pure guard. Uh, I think he's got the movement skills. I he's solid, right? Like I think if you draft him, he you plug him in at I think he was a left guard, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think so. And I think you just kind of have to accept that he's just going to be like a good football player. Right. Like, I don't know that he's going to do anything flashy for you. I don't think that he has a like a super high ceiling. Like, I don't think he's going to develop. But that was kind of Robert Hunt, though, too. I mean, right. Robert Hunt's a good football player. He got paid like a great one. I don't know if he's a great guard. He's just he's going to be a guard. He'll never be anything else. And round two, I'm, I'm fine. But I agree. That's who he is. Yeah, I agree. I just think you you have to be OK with that. And I yeah. misspoke earlier. He was a right guard. So he would actually okay. be Robert Hunt's replacement. For Robert Hunt. yep. um, style, uh, much different style to Robert Hunt. I think Hayes is more of like a mover, right? Like he's a zone blocking guy. Like I want him, you know, doing the outside stretch stuff. You know, Hunt, I, at least coming out of Louisiana Lafayette, was like kind of a downhill mauler type guy. Now, he had some athleticism and that worked out, blah, blah, blah. But different main of player, right? Like I think Haynes, if you're drafting him, you're drafting him because you like the way he moves. And we know Mike McDaniel, no matter what the position is, he likes fast guys, fast, big guys, fast, small guy, no matter. Um, so Haynes checks that box. I believe the other name you mentioned was Van Pran out of Georgia. Yeah. Um, 55 would be a little bit too rich for my blood. He's a day three guy for me. I think you like the experience. You like, uh, you know, his power. He's just like really inconsistent. I don't like, Center is a position and, and guard too for me is like I like floors to be high with those players. Like I, I don't need you to be a world beater, dude. Like go out there, win like most of your pass reps, and fine. Good. Yeah, like yeah. we'll call it a day. Uh and so Van Pran for me is like a little too inconsistent. And he just has like games where it's like, dude, like I know you're better than this. And when you start that many games, I start to worry about why you're not better than this. Um, so he's a day three guy for me. I think Haynes um, makes a lot of sense at 55. I think that would be a really good pick. Same thing with Frazier. I, I don't think Frazier will get there. He shouldn't get there. If he does, I think the Dolphins should take him. Okay. Um, any late round guys, sleeper types that might be a fit here before we get to running backs to wrap this up, which will not take long. Yeah, I'll do uh, one name who we didn't mention. Well, two, I guess. The first one is Bo Limmer from Arkansas. I don't know where he's going to go. I think he's probably somewhere on day two, but he could get to day three depending on how people value. He was the Arkansas center this past year. Um, Lighter guy, but like solid tape. You know, he's a good technician. Uh, I think he knows what he's doing out there. Good zone blocker. Uh, I like him. The other one I'll mention is Zach Zinter from Michigan. Um, He was like kind of getting projected as a top 50 pick 
I want to say he tore his ACL towards the end of the season. I know it was a major knee injury. Um, so he missed Michigan's run to the uh, national championship, but really big guard um, technician, a lot of experience, has some power to his game. He's not a very good mover. He, he's a bit stiff. I don't know if I like, so I don't know if he's the Dolphins type, but he might be sitting there around five just because he's not going to play a lot of football as a rookie. Yeah. And I honestly, I think he could be like, like I just mentioned, like just a guard who like, you know what? You plug him in, he's a 65 percentile player and you just forget about him for five years and then you draft another one, right? Like, so he could be that guy. Um, it's a good interior class. Like I, I would like to see Miami make a pick here. I, I really would. Like these are good football players. I don't know that the value is necessarily going to line up perfectly in round one. That's the problem. But if they trade back in round two and get a pick in round three, or they take someone late round two or even 55, or maybe if they can trade back at a pick around three or four, I would love to see it there. But we got a lot of Robert Jones, Lester Cotton, and yeah. Mike no, I the world it. on the team I already. It. I need someone better or who has a higher someone who could potentially be better than them. I don't need a flyer on a guard in round six because we got guys who we took flyers on who kind of panned out as flyers as second tier guys. Yeah. Yep. So no, that's good. where I am there. We'll see. I just, these are good players, man. Like we didn't talk about Dominic Pudi from Kansas. Uh, like I, I have think on my list. A, yeah. Yeah. I think he's a really good player. Um, Tanner Bordellini from Wisconsin. I think he's a good football player. Like, Christian Mahogany from Boston College. Like, I just, I think these guys are good. Like, I think there's going to be a lot of guys who are either like above average starters, normal starters, or like rotational starters that come from this group. And like, Miami needs that. Like, they do. Yes. Like, we can, we can argue about whether or not it's worth it at 21 or if the right guys on the board at 55. They, they, the offensive line has to be better this year. Wherever that comes from, it nice. has to be. And that's why if there is a chance to trade back round one or two to get extra picks this year, rounds three or four, um, you know, as long as you're still going to get someone that you – in round one, it's got to be someone that you really like. In round two, it's got to be someone that you just like. Um, it's wise because, you know, it, this draft is so deep in the positions they need. It's like th This is the perfect draft, and you wish this is a draft where they had some of those extra picks because offensive tackles, wide receivers, edge rusher – and even front seven, nose tackle, defensive tackle. There's so many guys. It's a deep draft at the positions of need, and you only got two picks in the first two rounds, and you got to wait to round five. It's like, eh, a couple more picks would be nice, and that's why if they can, you know, if they can go back from 55 to like 62 and get a pick in round three or something, awesome, because then you can take one of these offensive linemen there or take a wide receiver there, and know in round three you're going to get a guard or a wide receiver there. So we'll see. Now, running backs, here's the deal. We know Chris Greer does not value running backs. The fact he took one in round three last year with A-Chan is almost a minor miracle. But they just <laughs> gave an extension one year to Raheem Mostert. You got A-Chan on a rookie deal. They just re-signed Jeff Wilson. They re-signed Salvin Ahmed and Chris Brooks, who I know some Dolphins fans love. The guy had one good game versus the Broncos on a day. Everyone had a good game. And fan dons are like, Chris Brooks. Okay, calm down on Chris Brooks. But the point is they got five. I do not see any way in God's green earth that in rounds one or two they're taking a running back. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me round six or seven? Fine. But, again, at six or seven, you're getting a Gerald – what was the guy's name we took from Cincinnati there a few years back? Uh, Gerald, Gerald Dokes type. Yeah. It's like we're not uh, – fine. Do you see in any way in God – and first off, this isn't even a great running back class. It's really not. Is there any way in God's green earth the Dolphins take a running back – Rounds, I'm going to say it and try not to laugh. Rounds one or two. No. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, look, you want to talk about the top couple of running backs. You got uh, Trey Benson, Florida State, Blake Corum, Michigan, Jonathan Brooks, Texas. Are those your top three? You got right in there from Tennessee, maybe. You don't spend a lot of time because it's just Miami's not going to touch any of these guys. But how do you have them ranked? Yeah, so uh, my running back rankings are really weird to the consensus, and because Miami doesn't need one, I've kind of like ducked the group. I've only, yeah, exactly. I've only watched uh, twelve guys. Usually, I watch closer to twenty um, because I don't. I don't actually like scouting running backs, but I could talk about that for a whole podcast. Um, so my number know. one guy is Jonathan Brooks from Texas. I think if he doesn't tear the ACL, he's the best back in the class. Um, to put that in perspective, though, he's like my sixtieth overall player. So we're talking end of round two. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I like my hot take is I don't know if we see a running back go on the first two rounds of the draft at all. Like period. 
I, I like you must have got my notes. I have that as a question. Yeah, like I, I really, uh, I'm not saying I think it's going to happen. If I was a betting man, I don't know that I'd bet on it, but I don't know. I'd put it at like a 35 percent chance that there's not a running back that goes in the first two rounds. Which, like, I cannot remember the last time I thought that. Me neither. Um, I like Brooks though. I think he's got really good vision. I think he's got some burst. My next guy's Bucky Irvin from Oregon. I, I just think he's fun as hell. I feel the same way about Trey Benson. Like they're smaller, but they've got like really good contact balance. They just kind of like pinball their way around. And before you know it, they got like seven yards, um, but they're like really small. And Bucky Irvin's testing was not good. I didn't dock him for it because I went back and watched his tape and I still thought he was like fine. Um, but his testing wasn't great at his size. Trey Benson, I had his RB1 in the summer, but he didn't play as well as I wanted him to this year. He was so good. Like he's fine to me. Like, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on these backs. Like, no, we're not. These, <laughs> these are, these are rotational backs. These are complementary backs in this class, right? Like if I really like Jalen, right. Um, I'm going to release an article on Friday where I highlight my favorite player from every position in this draft class. Jalen writes the running back that I picked. I really like him. I have a fourth round grade on him. He's like the lightning to the thunder. Like this is a guy who gets 10 carries per game. He runs really, really fast in a straight line, and he's a really good pass blocker, which is why he's my favorite running back in this class. Ironically, it's nothing to do with what he does with the football. I don't care about that. He pass blocks, and he's awesome. Um, Braylon Allen's really cool. Big dude, runs downhill. He's a gap power guy. There's a lot of zone schemes in the NFL. I don't know how many teams are going to be in on him. I like Braylon Allen. He's like my RB3, but scheme-specific player. I I don't know he's going to be a fit for everybody. We could go... On and on, I, I think all of these guys are just, they're complimentary guys. They're guys in a room who get 10 to 15 touches a game at max. If they have to be the starter because somebody gets hurt, you live with it for a couple games. But I don't know. I, I don't think we, I would not take it. I, I would not take any of these backs in the first two rounds of the draft. That is just my opinion. One, I don't think we need one at all in this draft. You want to The Dolphins don't at all. Draft. I'm talking well, you want to the see, other yeah. 31 teams. There are 31 teams you probably avoid too. If, I wouldn't take them in the first two rounds. The Dolphins, unless you have like a perfect roster and you're just adding, like that, yeah, that's different. Yeah, the uh, Dolphins. But how many teams have that? Yeah. The only reason the Dolphins should add a running back in this draft is if they think he's a better kick returner than Braxton Barrios. That's true. That's it. That's and you're that's, still looking around six or seven at that point. Yeah, yeah, that those are like the kids from Louisville, Gerard Jordan, Isaac. Um, Guiardo, I forget how to say his name on top of my head. Tyrone Tracy from Purdue. Those are like the kickoff guys, right? Like if you take them around six, like, sure, that's fine. You're yeah. not a running back. You're a kick returner. That's fine. Yeah. I just don't see Miami. It just makes no sense with all the other needs they have. This one really can be ignored this year. Last thing I sent you this the other day. I will read it. Cause I'm sure you probably forgot already. I put out my first Miami Dolphins mock draft, the 1.0 mm. and who I had for the Dolphins. I will go through a quick here. Number one, first round 21, Byron Murphy, who I don't think probably be there now, um, but who knows? Round two, Roman Wilson, the wide receiver. Uh, round five, Isaiah Adams, offensive tackle, athletic enough to move into guard from Illinois. Um, round six, Dominique Hampton, who I like a lot. He might not even be there round six. A safety from Washington. Um, other pick in round six was Nathaniel Watson, the linebacker from Miss State. Miss State, and of course, pick seven, the punter from Vandy, Matthew Hayball. Give me an A, B, C, D, or F grade on my first Dolphins mock draft. Ooh. I saw a B plus. I saw a B plus. I'll take it. I like it. I'll take I, it. I don't think Murphy's um, going to be there. That's That really makes yeah, me sad. We'll, we'll talk about that. Next we show, the, we're going to talk about him. Yeah, yeah, we do the D-line show. I like the other D-lineman that gets mocked to Miami Newton? a little bit more than – Yeah, I like Newton. Newton's – I think Mel Kuyper had him round two today. Dude, Mel's killing it, man. Round two, but it was still Mel's round two. Me. Roman Wilson Mel- is like such a Dolphins pick. Like that's such he a is. like they let Mike and McDaniel in the draft room. There. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> because here's the deal: when I'm sitting there and I'm like, I want obviously, as we talked about last week, someone with some size to compliment our little guys. Problem is, I don't think anyone with size is going to fall there. So I'm like, well, who might fall? I'm like Roman Wilson. You know, most people have him top fifty. I'm gonna, let me get to Mel right here, real quick. Um, I got it open. Mel had like Roman, I think, go in. So he had Newton going 42 to Houston, which, I mean, if Houston gets him, talk about the best offseason ever. Oh, Good man. Lord. Um, and he had Roman going 49 to Cincy. Now, mind you, I did mine last weekend before Mel put this out. I had no idea what Mel was doing. He also has Patrick Paul going 52 uh, to the Eagles. Um, well, as long as it's not 55, we're good. Yeah, exactly. You go 52. Well, I had Roman. Like, he's the perfect 
you know, Mike McDaniel guy, compliment speed with speed. He can play slot <laughs> and they need a wide receiver. So that's why I, that was where my logic with the first two, of course, with the ones later, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. I admit there, but, uh, but finding an offensive tackle can move into guard who has the athleticism. I found one of them safety. I think they need to add a safety at some point. So I found one there late round. So that was my logic. And of course the punter, just cause I'm still mad that we re-signed Jake Bailey and we'll <laughs> fire Danny Crossman. You, you, That's you sort of a, just my F2 you pick. We gotta, in, this, we gotta get have some competition every here. Every yeah. year you get a punter in. Oh uh, my it's, God. It's until we repl- until we find one who's halfway decent, but yeah. So maybe by next week's show, I have a new 2.0. I don't know, but that was my logic there. And I'll take the B plus. That makes me proud. Everyone. Be sure to follow Dante Colinelli on Twitter at Dante Colinelli. Read his work at alldolphins.com. And every now and then he puts stuff up for us to a Dolphins Talk. Follow us um, on Twitter at Dolphins Talk. And go to the website, dolphinstalk.com. We got a bunch of articles, player profiles, a bunch of mock drafts from all around the country from people like Mel. CBS today put one out, had us taking a corner in round one. Very interesting. The kid from Iowa. Um, oh, Dejean. I Dejean. Or yeah, they, sure. CBS. Yep. Round one. CBS one. Round Oof. one. That's the first time I've seen a corner get mocked to us round one or two, and Cooper Dijon or Jean, whatever from Iowa, who you know is a round one player probably. I just don't think it's a need for my. I mean, he can play safety. Yeah, that's the that would probably be the deal. Um, that's, but yeah, the, so, that's the the thought process yeah. there. So next I, show yeah. we're probably going to talk edge rushers and defensive tackles, and the final show we'll go linebackers and secondary. Um, but yeah, so everyone, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. Myself and Dante, take care, and folks, don't forget, please, we must put an end to highway profanity. <laughs>